Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Wong. I'm an Associate Professor based in the School of Biological Sciences at Monash University. And today I'm going to be talking about the challenges that uh, some wildlife face when it comes to sex in an increasingly human-dominated world. So I'm a behavioural ecologist, which means that I'm interested in understanding animal behaviour from an ecological and evolutionary uh, perspective. And uh, for most of my career, I've been focusing in on the reproductive antics of fish. And I've been really fortunate during the course of my career to have travelled to some really amazing places around the world, from the Crater Lakes of Nicaragua uh, to the desert springs and rivers of Central Australia, uh, which is home to this particular critter, the Australian Desert Gobi. But during the course of my career, as I was travelling to these amazing locations, it became increasingly apparent that human-induced environmental change was having a huge impact on the natural world. And I was increasingly being greeted by scenes such as this. So what we have here is uh, one of my field sites, Ockenden Springs in Central Australia, which is home to the Australian Desert Gobi. And you can see the human activities uh, have left their mark. In particular, livestock grazing in this case. Uh, the cattle have trampled the margins of the spring, and they're also contributing uh, nutrients and other pollutants directly uh, into the water. And you can probably see that there's a cow that's managed to get itself stuck in the spring itself. It's died, and it's in the process of decomposing, and, and all, of, all of the decomposition is going straight into the water itself. So scenes like this made me increasingly interested in trying to understand how human-induced environmental change might affect uh, reproduction and what the ecological and evolutionary uh, consequences of that might be. Now, several hundred kilometres west of Ockenden Springs lies the coastal town of Dongara uh, in Western Australia. And several uh, decades earlier, uh, long before I started my uh, academic career, a couple of scientists were walking in the bush just outside of town and they came across this rather intriguing site. Now, what was actually happening here is that the male beetles were being drawn to the brown, shiny surfaces of the empty stubbies, which actually bear a striking resemblance to the brown, shiny surfaces of the forewings of real females. But, with, of course, with one notable difference, and that is that uh, beer bottles are much larger than real females. So these beer bottles were acting as a sexy, supernormal stimulus that was actually attracting all of these male beetles. So apart from losing out on real reproductive success, uh, the scientists also noted that there was an another cost. Uh, the male beetles were being attacked by ferocious meat ants. So initially, when you look at a scene like this, you might think it's kind of funny, beetles on the bottle, but it does underscore a really important possibility, and that is that our activities can potentially impact reproduction in wildlife. Now, most of you will be familiar with the concept of natural selection, which Charles Darwin came up with to explain the evolution of traits, including the evolution of behaviours uh, that are driven uh, by the struggle to survive. So a good example would be uh, prey species uh, that have evolved traits to help them survive against predators. But of course, Darwin recognised that merely surviving uh, wasn't enough. Um, animals also have to reproduce. And he came up with the concept of sexual selection to explain the evolution of traits and behaviours that are driven not by the struggle to survive, but by the struggle to reproduce. And today we know that sexual selection is a powerful evolutionary force that is responsible for much of the weird and wonderful diversity of life that we see on this planet. So sexual selection, for example, is responsible for the evolution of weapons, uh, such as the antlers that we see in these stags, which males use to fight one another for access to breeding females. Sexual selection is also responsible for the bright coloration and gaudy plumage and ostentatious courtship displays of birds of paradise, which males use to attract females for mating. Now, scientists know that sexually selected traits are generally also very costly uh, for animals to produce, and they're context-dependent. So using the uh, peacock as an example, we all know that uh, male peacocks are brightly coloured and they have this uh, elaborate train of long tail feathers which they display to females during courtship. But of course, bearing such a, an expensive, uh, elaborate trait uh, can be energetically costly, and it can also increase the vulnerability of males to would-be predators like tigers. So the idea here is that only the highest quality males, the highest quality suitors, should be able to bear the high cost of producing and maintaining these showy, sexy traits. But of course, showing off requires a context. And an important question to ask is, well, what happens when that context changes? What happens when the environment changes uh, and, and how does that impact uh, reproductive behaviours and sexual selection? 
So as I mentioned, humans have brought about unprecedented changes to environments worldwide. So researchers such as, such as myself are increasingly becoming interested in trying to understand how these in, uh, changes might impact animal behavior, and in particular, reproductive behaviors. Now, one potential impact of human activity, especially in aquatic habitats, is eutrophication. So eutrophication occurs when there's an input in nutrients from human activities, for example, from agriculture, and as a result of this increase in nutrients entering aquatic ecosystems, we end up with rampant algal blooms. And one consequence of these rampant algal blooms is, is that it can diminish the visibility in the water column, making it very difficult for aquatic inhabitants to see one another. So how might this increased murkiness affect visual sexual signals? An infamous example comes from uh, East Africa in Lake Victoria where scientists a few years ago were studying these beautiful fish called cichlids. And what scientists uh, observed was that increased uh, eutrophication and increased murkiness in the water meant that females were no longer able to tell the difference apart between males of their own species and males of a closely related species. And as a result, females were making mistakes during mate choice and they were actually mating with males of the other species, resulting in hybrids and also the loss of biodiversity. And some of my own research further north in Europe on another species of fish, the three-spined stickleback, is also illustrative. So together with colleagues in Finland, we showed that increased murkiness from the water as a result of algal blooms uh, made it more difficult for female sticklebacks to properly assess potential suitors. Now, as a result, females were mating with poor quality males who are also more likely to cannibalize the eggs that the female leaves with him in his nest. Here it's important to point out that human activities not only affect visual sexual signals. We all know, of course, the human population is ever expanding, and of course, along with that, uh, there's also an increase in the number of cities and the expansion of urbanization. Indeed, it's been estimated by 2030, some 60% of the human population will be inhabiting urban environments. And of course, urban environments differ quite dramatically from more natural environments that wildlife might have evolved under. So for one, urban environments tend to be extremely noisy. And secondly, the buildings themselves can actually interfere with the transmission of acoustic signals. So we know that many urban wildlife communicate acoustically. So males of many species of birds, for example, sing to attract females for mating. And it's been shown that some species of birds, such as this great tit here, actually raise or elevate the pitch of their calls so they can be heard against the low frequency pitch of uh, urban noise. And we see this not only in birds, so there's also evidence in frogs, for example, in these brown tree frogs, that males will also call at a higher frequency so they can be um, heard against the urban noise. And it's not only pitch adjustments uh, that are important, there's evidence, for example, in noisy miners, that birds may have to call louder in order to be heard, and research done on another species of bird called the silver eye showed that males actually now sing uh, less complex songs so that those signals can travel further through the urban environment. At the moment, it's still unclear, however, how these kinds of vocal adjustments might actually impact the attractiveness of the caller. Another consequence of human activities is pollution of the environment with a whole range of different kinds of chemicals. Now, particularly insidious are so-called endocrine disrupting chemicals. Now, these are a wide range of different chemical compounds. They include things like certain pesticides, some plastics, and even some of the medication that we would take or that we would give to livestock. All of these have the capacity to potentially interfere with the normal hormone functioning of animals, often at very low concentrations. Now, alarmingly, endocrine disrupting chemicals have turned up in the tissues of wildlife living in even some of the most remote regions on Earth. So, for example, they've turned up in the tissues of crustaceans living in the world's deepest oceans. They've turned up in fish uh, living adjacent to Antarctic research stations. And, of course, turned up also in uh, the tissues of polar bears living in the Arctic. In an Australian context, we know that endocrine disrupting chemicals are both an environmental and huge health problem as well. So this is underscored by health warnings against the consumption of tainted um, seafood, and there are also concerns about the security of Australia's freshwater supply, uh, fears about contamination by endocrine-disrupting um, chemicals. Now, most of these uh, pollutants enter the environment through wastewater effluent, 
Uh, but of course, agriculture can also be an important source. So countries such as Australia still use hormonal growth promotants to help increase meat yields in livestock such as beef cattle. Some of these chemicals can also end up in the environment and expose uh, wildlife uh, to these potential endocrine disruptors. And research right around the world, including some of the research that we've been carrying out in my lab, uh, have found or reported a whole range of different kinds of impacts uh, in a wide suite of different species when exposed to endocrine disruptors. So they range from uh, eggshell thinning in birds uh, to genital abnormalities in alligators and also disturbed reproductive behaviours. So as early as the 1950s, uh, researchers noted uh, altered courtship behaviours in American bald eagles that had been exposed to the pesticide a DTT. Now, so far, all of the examples I've talked about have highlighted how environmental changes can have a negative impact on reproduction, but it's important to point out that it's not always bad news. So, a local example comes from bowerbirds. So, male bowerbirds construct an elaborate bower out of sticks and twigs, and they also decorate the front of the bower, the court of the bower, with found objects. Now, normally in the wild, they would use colourful berries or flowers to decorate their bowers. But you can see the male here has actually decorated his bower with found blue rubbish objects. And these blue objects are actually preferred by females. So by gathering these rubbish objects and decorating his bower, the male is able to increase his reproductive success. Further afield in Europe, researchers have also shown that black kites, a species of bird, have started to incorporate white plastic materials into their nest and scientists have shown that the amount of white plastic rubbish incorporated into the nest uh, acted as an accurate signal or an honest signal of the nest builder's fighting prowess. So here's another example of how a species has been able to make use of human altered conditions. And of course, an understanding of animal behaviour can also be used to affect positive conservation outcomes. A really good example of this is seen in New Zealand uh, in regard to the plight of this particular species of bird called the takahe. So Takahe numbers have plummeted as a result of the introduction of mammalian predators, specifically stoats, into New Zealand. And what scientists did a few years ago was actually uh, give uh, Takahe chicks uh, to uh, foster parents of another species of bird called the purple swamp hen. So purple swamp hens are from Australia and they have had an evolutionary history with mammalian predators. And what the scientists were able to show was that by rearing Takahe chicks with these foster parent swamp, hen, swamp hens, the, uh, the chicks were able to learn how to recognise potential predators from their foster parents. So I guess the main take-home message is that human-induced environmental change uh, can uh, impact uh, reproductive behaviours, and this can have consequences uh, for sexual selection, uh, the ecological uh, and also evolutionary processes. And it's very important to understand uh, sex in an increasingly human-dominated world so we can understand better why some species are able to flourish under human-altered conditions while others flounder. Thank you. <laughs>